good. Technology is so wonderful, but so frustrating too. I was like, how come nothing's happening? I can hear fine now. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so glad we're finally able to get together. So I have some questions just to get started with you. I know you've probably been answering so many questions from all over the world about the work that you're doing, but I would like to just begin the conversation with where you are right now and the work that you're doing right now, and then we can go back and, and get the history of what led you to this work. I'm Dr. Gladys Kalemazik Soka, founder and chief executive officer of Conservation Through Public Health which is a grassroots NGO that improves the health of the people and the animals in and around protected areas in Africa and also wildlife-rich habitats. And we do this so that we can prevent, we can promote conservation and prevent disease transmission where people, wildlife and livestock meet. We've been doing this work since 2003 um, as a U.S. registered nonprofit and a Ugandan NGO, and more recently we also added a component of alternative livelihoods, where we can get because we found out that many people were unhealthy because they were poor, so we started uh, Gorilla Conservation Coffee Social Enterprise in 2016, which gives the farmers a premium prices for great coffee, which we then sell to the tourists, expatriates, coffee drinking Ugandans and around the world. And a donation goes back to support the work of conservation through public health, to improve community health, gorilla health, and conservation education in the communities, also where the farmers are found. And right now, we are very concerned about COVID-19. Uh, it started off as an epidemic in China, but now it's spread to many different countries and has been declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization. And what this means is that it's spreading very fast, much faster than everybody expected. And we just got our first few cases in Uganda two weeks ago. We now have 48 cases of COVID. And we, we started CTPH because we had a scabies skin disease outbreak in the critically endangered mountain gorillas, which was traced to people living around the park who have very little health care. Uh, one of the biggest threats to the survival of the gorillas, on top of habitat loss and habitat destruction where they're found, is disease from closely related humans. We share over 98% genetic material and can easily make each other sick. Um, so when they got the scabies and the baby gorilla died and the rest only recovered with treatment, this happened when I was working as a first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. We later on set up conservation through public health to improve the health of both the people and the wildlife, especially the gorillas and closely related primates, so that we can prevent disease between them. Um, COVID-19, just as scabies spread easily between people and gorillas, COVID-19 can also spread easily between people and gorillas. We have um, respiratory diseases. Whenever you visit the gorillas, you get as close as seven meters to them. And sometimes, quite often, unfortunately, that rule is broken and people and gorillas get much closer to each other. And so it's easy to cough on a gorilla and give it the disease. And so with COVID-19, we're very concerned about this. And we decided to work with the park staff, train them how to better keep gorillas away from people during gorilla visits and people away from gorillas. So managing the tourists when they visit the gorillas making sure that we maintain the seven meter distance. Um, also, we also got them to make sure that anyone who's sick should not go up. Anyone who's coughing, sneezing, showing other signs of illness shouldn't go up. We've also given them infrared thermometers so that they can catch somebody even if they're not showing signs of coughing or sneezing. But once they get to the gorillas, they have to maintain that seven meter distance. We are also providing masks for the park staff. This began last week when we did the training they're wearing masks and they're also wearing, um, they're wearing uh, masks on their faces so that if by mistake you happen to cough or sneeze next to a gorilla, they're not gonna get the droplets. And this is going to continue even after the pandemic ends and tourism resumes. Last week, tourism was stopped because of this great threat to the great apes. Um, but now, even after the pandemic ends, this rule is going to remain because we really have to make sure that they don't pick up any other respiratory diseases from people 
and that could harm them because there's only about 459 gorillas in Bwindi and 1,063 mountain gorillas in the whole world. And so we're very concerned that the mountain gorilla population is still very small, although it's growing. And if you don't protect them, the very people who are coming in to provide, um, you know, to pay for them, to see them, which then supports the wildlife authority and the local communities, could be the very people who end up resulting in their extinction. So those are the kind of things we're doing around COVID. We are also, of course, focusing a lot about making sure people don't make each other sick. So we're working closely with the local health centers and the Ministry of Health. And conservation through public health is on the National Disease Task Force that advises the government and gets involved in making sure that people are not picking up this pandemic from each other and spreading it to wildlife as well. So we're working with the park staff and our volunteers who go to the communities to educate them about good health care, good hygiene, and good conservation practices. Um, those same communities, we're about to go and train them to make sure that they don't make each other sick and their community members don't make each other sick. So simple things like hand washing, disinfectant, especially hand washing, that's the most simple intervention that can be done in a rural area anywhere in the world. Um, hand washing, and then the gorilla guardians who safely chase gorillas back to the park when they come out, they're all being given masks as well as the park staff to make sure that when they're herding gorillas back, they're not going to cough on them and make them sick. So those are all the kind of things we're doing right now. That's amazing. Um, tell me what would happen if the gorilla, if a gorilla were to get this virus, do you really believe that this would be potentially dangerous to extinction for the gorilla population there? Yes, if the gorillas were to get COVID-19, it would likely have the very same effect as it's having in um, people. And it could be even worse because gorillas are also, you know, like it would be a naive, it would be a, the gorillas probably have never been exposed to coronavirus, just like many people haven't, especially this strain. And so if it's coming from a related host and you're naive to something, the disease is much worse, which is what the problem was with the scabies. So definitely it can wipe out a gorilla group very easily because they'll groom each other in the group so there's no social distancing for them. And then if one group, one, a female crosses over to another group, which happens often, or the two groups fight, then it can spread to another group. So we're very concerned about that. So you mentioned before that this virus really caught you off guard. What did you have to do as an organization to suddenly make a shift and focus on this particular issue? Um, yeah, this virus caught us off guard. So as an organization, we realized that because we were set up to prevent disease between people and wildlife, that's why we set up the NGO. We realized that this is an area that we definitely have to address. It's a one health issue. One health is when you address human, animal and ecosystem health together. And we set up one of the first field programs in the world for One Health. And so we felt that this is something that we definitely need to do something about. So we decided to um, really start working on the COVID thing. Um, we talked to the park staff, we talked to the park managers and the wildlife authority, and they also felt that it was a very timely, it was very timely to educate them how not to make tourists, how, how to stop tourists making gorillas sick or any other visitor to the gorillas which includes the park staff who have to visit them every day and any tourists who come to visit and any researchers. We felt that this is something that our NGO was set up to do and we're best placed to address this particular issue of One Health, which is addressing human, animal and ecosystem health together. So the approach that we're using to address COVID-19 is a One Health approach where we're looking at the human health, preventing disease from human to human and animal health, preventing disease from people to animals. COVID originated from the Chinese wet market where somebody, you know, people ate either bats or something like that, which bats are carriers of coronavirus, maybe not necessarily this strain, but they're, they're known carriers of coronavirus and it could have spread from bats or any other animal in the market to people who ate them and it can just as easily jump from people back to, the, back to wildlife. And so this is an area that our NGO addresses. This is what we do. 
and we are best in a very good position to do something and do a lot of, you know, do a lot in COVID-19, not only in directly preventing disease between people and endangered gorillas, um, endangered mountain gorillas or creature endangered other gorilla species, but we are also in a very good position to educate people about this particular issue because that's what we deal with. So, you know, raising a lot of awareness about the risks of disease spread between people and animals and how and why we should prevent it. So whatever we're doing right now, right from telling people not to eat meat from an unknown source, you know, things like the wet markets should really stop, you know, because it's a source of quite a lot of disease. It's not the first time. Um, there's been SARS, there's been MERS, and all of this comes about because of, you know, eating animals in such conditions, which you're not really supposed to be eating. And then it mutates, comes into the people, spreads within the people. It's just that now the scale is much, much greater than it's ever been before. And probably the last time there's been such a disease like this, they keep saying it was 100 years ago in 1918 with the Spanish flu. So it's, it's actually quite scary. And, you know, it's now, and it's easier now for such diseases to move around the world because the air travel is much more frequent now. Um, there's a lot of air travel. I mean, I was supposed to go to Italy. Uh, I'd just been from Scotland, mm. where we're really pleased to have won the St. Andrew's Prize for the Environment, Conservation Through Public Health. So I got back end of February. And then I was supposed to go to Italy um, on the 7th of March. And just before the travel, we had to cancel the trip. And then the cases in Italy started building up drastically, and now it's a complete nightmare. It's, it's like the worst hit country. I've had over 14,000 deaths. And then it just happened in the space of a month. Could you believe it? One month. All of this has, it's really gone out of hand in Italy. And then was, I was supposed to go to America <laughs> on the 17th of March and to New York. Oh my goodness. 17th. Yeah. And everything went crazy just before that. And yeah, New York is also a huge mess. And yeah, they're supposed to go to Washington DC end of April. There's all lots of places that, you know, I don't travel. I travel a lot, but the people even travel much more than me. So air travels become so frequent. And this time around, just stopping air travel is going to stop the disease spreading from one country to another. But unfortunately, once it's already in a country, it's difficult to stop it spreading within the country. And, and so the cases we got in Uganda came from other countries like Dubai. A, pl a flight came in from Dubai, UK and America. Those are the cases that... The people who have got it, they, those are the countries they've been coming from. So, yeah, it's a very scary disease. And as long as there's going to be air travel, there's going to be uh, people building up the high population growth and lots of building up in, in many areas where even wildlife, habit, wildlife used to live. Um, it's also going to make it worse. And also the climate change, you know, the climate is changing a lot. It's getting a bit warmer and infectious diseases can now multiply much faster and more and more emerging diseases come out can come out because the weather is more favorable so all of these factors are resulting in such pandemics occurring and we and since we're what we generally visit primates like the gorillas and the chimpanzees and the money that people pay for that helps to support their conservation um, in a very sustainable way we have to make sure that we don't make them sick from such diseases that we could be picking up from around the world. Mm -hmm. Right. How are people receiving this education when you're going into these communities and you're explaining the situation about the virus and the potential uh, transmission from humans to gorillas? People are receiving the information very well because, number one, this virus is actually affecting people directly. They know that it, they can get sick from it, and it's a reality. They're seeing that people are getting sick, people are dying, and they know that they can get sick. And they know, also know that it's preventable, depending on how you, you know, if you, if you wash your hands, disinfect them, put on masks, carry out social distancing, it's preventable. So it's easier to convince people to do all this because this is affecting them directly. And also, it's, in, it's easy to convince them because people are benefiting so much from the tourism of gorillas. Gorilla tourism is a huge revenue for the country. And it's lifted the communities of Windy out of poverty. 
Brindley Penjoba National Park. So they know that if the gorillas go die, then they will be stuck. You know, like they will lose a very important and viable source of revenue that has developed their community, brought hope and lifted them out of poverty. So it's easier to convince them because the gorillas are really have transformed their lives and you know, made them, you know, really made their lives much better just by being next to the gorillas and benefiting through tourism, directly or indirectly. They can benefit directly also through employment. Some of them are hired by the park. Some of the majority of them are hired by the park, actually. 90% of the park staff are from the community. Um, they are also benefiting from selling crafts to the communities, food, accommodation, um, taking people on village walks, you know, just all those kind of things to see what the, what the community life is like. Everybody's benefiting. Some people are having their children's school fees paid by tourists who come. Schools have been built because of tourism revenue and uh, clinics and roads, and they're getting better health care because of that. Um, our NGO actually improves the health of the people and around the park because they're living next to gorillas. And other NGOs are providing other livelihood options for them and improving their lives in different ways. So they're benefiting so much because of living next to gorillas. So they don't want to make the gorillas sick. And it seems like such a catch-22 because of the tourism. So much is improved, but at the same time, it's the tourists that are bringing in potential disease from around the world. Yes, it's a catch-22. It's a very tight balance between... Um, yeah, conservation and economics, but definitely we found that the gorilla populations that have grown in number, the mountain have been those where there's tourism. Um, because other populations where there's no tourism or no benefits for the community, if a gorilla comes to their garden, they'll kill it um, because they don't get any benefit from it. They'll destroy the habitats where gorillas and other species are found because they're not getting any benefit and their numbers are going down drastically like the Eastern Lowland Gorillas, the Western Lowland Gorillas, the Cross River Gorillas. There's a lot of hunting. But the places where the mountain gorillas are found, because tourism has really made a difference over the past 25 years, at least in Uganda, and longer in Rwanda, um, and in DRC, to a certain extent, it's helped. The places where there's gorilla tourism, the numbers of gorillas are growing. So it's kind of like a necessary evil. But if it's not carefully managed, it could go the, in the wrong way. Yeah. Um, Dr. Gladys, I'm going to not keep you very long because I know you're very busy, but I wanted to ask what about this, how did you come to care about this work? I mean, did, have you always been interested in this type of conservation? How did you personally become connected with this type of work? Um, I've always, um, I grew up in a home with many pets and they became my friends. I was the last born in the family and the person I followed, my sister's five and a half years older than me. And my older brother, who's 10 years older than me, used to always bring stray dogs and cats home. So I got, I got attached to animals in that way. They became my playmates. And then at the age of 12, I decided I wanted to be a veterinarian. Then when I was in high school in Uganda, I got an opportunity to revive the wildlife club in the school I was at as a chairperson and it was a life-changing experience for me because I got to really get interested in wildlife and the conservation issues and we took the students to the national park and I really got interested in wildlife. So by the time I started university, I felt like I wanted to be a veterinarian who also worked with wildlife. So when I started university at the Royal Veterinary College, University of London, I got a chance to work, you're given a chance to work with animals of your choice so I got to finally work with chimpanzees in the wild and then mountain gorillas in Buindi. And that was when I decided I just want to be a wildlife vet. And I, this led me to become the first wildlife vet for Uganda. And they decided they needed a veterinarian when gorilla tourism began because they were concerned about disease from, you know, people to the gorillas, just like COVID-19. And so they thought they needed a veterinarian. And I was hired as the first vet because I had the most relevant experience having done research um, as a vet student, looking at parasites and gorillas visited by tourists and those that are not. So that's where my wildlife career really started with the wildlife clubs of Uganda. And then being the only vet in the organization, I learned a lot from everyone around me about conservation. And I applied what I knew 
And so we're doing a lot of work. So the, there's a field called conservation medicine, which our NGO really does. It's a good example of conservation medicine because that's what we do. And so that's what I've been doing. I've been in the field of conservation medicine since that time. And then we started the non-profit after doing a master's at North Carolina State University and North Carolina Zoo, uh, Zoo Medicine Residency, where I looked at tuberculosis in people, wildlife and livestock, including gorillas, um, trying to prevent disease between the three. And I realized that it'd be good to set up an NGO that looks at this issue. Also having had the, dealt with the first KB skin disease outbreak as a first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. So yeah, so this is how I got into all of this through the wildlife clubs of Uganda. That's where it all began. <laughs> as, a, as a high school student. Okay, I see. And it sounds to me as though you are inherently a problem solver. Has that always been the case? Have you always been somebody who sees a problem and you want to get involved and have strategies and figure out a way to have a solution? Yes. Yes, I am. I think I am. <laughs> I'm wired that way. It, did you grow up that way? Did you have somebody in your life who really influenced I'm you to away. be a problem solver? Or is that just something that comes naturally to you? Um, let me think about that. Let me see. I would say that, you know, I, I hated to see animals suffering. You know, if my pets got sick, I um, had to make sure they go to the vet before I go to school. So I wanted to alleviate their suffering. So I guess I'm the kind of person who wants, when I see something wrong, I want to make it right. I'm naturally like that, but also my, my parents um, accomplished a lot in Uganda. They, you know, my mom was one of the first women members of parliament and she's at the forefront of the women's movement in Uganda because she doesn't, she wants better opportunities for women and better rights for women. So I guess maybe I come from a family of people who want to, who are changing the world in a different, in all kinds of ways. Um, my sister and brother are also doing a lot, like my brother was a research chemical engineer in DuPont and now he's, gone, he's become an economist and he's doing a lot to try and help to develop the country. My brother William, Dr. William Kalema, and then my sister, Dr. Veronica Kalema, is, is also, she's a finance expert and she's done a lot with finance. And right now she's working in a bank, she's worked in various banks. So I guess we're... Actually, one point she presented to Colin Powell when he was Secretary of State many years ago. So she's kind of, so I come from a family of people who, you know, want to make things better and put in the effort to make things better. How can people support the work and support your efforts, raise awareness? What can people do to get involved in the work that you're doing? Yes, I mean, what people can do to get involved in the work we're doing um, they can raise awareness. They can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, as there's, uh, I'll send you the links. Okay, there's, there's uh, at Dr. Gladys, and then there is at CTPH Uganda for Twitter. And then on Facebook, there's my Dr. Gladys Kalema Zixoka and Conservation Through Public Health. We also have Gorilla Conservation Coffee. So we'll send you those links. And because when you share the word and more and more people know about it, it results in much more support. Um, they can visit our website, www.ctph.org.org. And people can also through our, donate towards our work. We're trying, looking for funding to be able to get to these communities where gorillas are found. Actually, not only in Uganda, but other countries as well, like in DRC, where we are just beginning to start a program with the Eastern Lowland Gorillas. And we do want to do similar work with them as well, especially during COVID so people can give a donation through our website. Um, we, ha we have various platforms over there. And once the COVID is over, people can come and visit, can come and visit, see our work and volunteer with us, you know, in whichever skill set they have, which they feel can help. And this can be through, you know, developing educational materials, being part of our, supporting our public health team, supporting our veterinary team, supporting conservation education. There are many different ways that people can contribute. We have a guerrilla health and community conservation center built with funding from TUSC and people can go and also if they're interested in lab work, they can help out there or in many other ways. So once it's over, once the COVID pandemic is over, people can visit. But in the meantime, what people can do is spread the word about our work and support our work 
through giving a donation. That's wonderful. Are they still allowing travelers to come in as tourists right now? No, guerrilla tourism was suspended last week um, to the national parks. And because right now Uganda is in a lockdown, they're stopping people moving just because they don't want the pandemic to go beyond the cases that we have. And so they stopped public transportation and very limited movement only for essential services like the ones that we're doing right now, educating people and educating, preventing disease between people and endangered mountain gorillas. Um, so members of the task force, health teams, veterinary, emergency veterinary services and health services, food suppliers, those are the only services which are allowed to keep going. Um, and the main reason why tourism was stopped was also because of the concern of disease from people to gorillas. But the park staff still have to visit the gorillas every single day because if you don't visit them, they can get poached or harmed because they think that everybody's good. And if you're not visiting them every day, bad people can visit them and harm them. So, it's, so the park staff still have to visit them. And that's why we train them on how they should have that social distancing, you know, put on masks, keep the right distance. And then when the tourism begins, then there'll be have practiced this a lot and it will be easier for them to get the tourists to do the same things and enforce the guidelines. Did you hear me, Sina? Mm -hmm. Hi, Sina. Ah, there you are. Okay. I lost you momentarily. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Dr. Gladys, I'm going to let you go with that next conversation. I would really love to talk more about the coffee and how that's supporting you, but we'll, we'll leave this one for now. I will do my best to share this and bring awareness to oh, yeah. an audience who may not otherwise even know about this issue. So I am very grateful for you taking the time with me today, even with the technical difficulties. <laughs> well, thank you so much for supporting us. And we're hoping that um, our Gorilla Conservation Coffee, will, you know, you'll be able to start selling it soon. Um, you know, once the pandemic is over, <laughs> we can get it. But even now, there's a lady from UK who um, wants us to send it to her through cargo flights, if they're still flying. So let's see how that goes. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I will continue to spread the word about the coffee. And I still hope someday to reschedule... Or maybe, who knows, maybe everything will be done in time that we can still schedule our international learning opportunity to come and visit you with our HPI group. Yeah, that would be fantastic. That really will. Well, we look forward to hosting you in Windy one day. Tendo, say hello to Sina. Tendo's the one with chicken pox. He's much happier now. Hi, Tendo. I understand. Oh, my goodness. I feel for you. I understand. I had the chicken pox and it was miserable. I'm so glad to hear that you're feeling better. <laughs> okay. All right, I hope to meet you someday, Tendo. Me too. <laughs> Dr. Gladys, <laughs> thank you so much. I'm going to let you back to your Saturday, and I hope to talk to you again okay. soon. Okay, that would be great. Thank you so much, Sina, and uh, to keep up the great work you're doing. Thank you so much for joining me for today's interview. If you'd like to learn more about the Human Picture Initiative, you can find us at hpimedia.com. And also, we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to share stories about the ways in which you're making positive contributions, if you'd like to share with us people you feel might be a great fit for this interview series, please email us at info at hpimedia.com. Last request, if you would like to ensure that we continue to be found in podcast land, be sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever it is that you get your podcast. And until next time, keep doing meaningful work.